Now on for the second of three programmes examining the effect of the current massive third world debt on our high street banks. This week a look at the cost of credit in a matter of life and debt. The Dominican Republic today shines as a beacon of freedom-loving people everywhere. It is fitting that the Dominican Republic, with its stability and political liberty, now shows others the way. I can tell any Minister of Finance what the IMF will seek in order for them to assist. Definitely, he will need to devalue. He will need to reduce the deficit. He will need to do a number of things that are similar to all countries. There must be different diseases, surely. And not all diseases can be cured by penicillin. Bad medicine tastes bad. The IMF says to the country, you don't have the money. Uh, you've got to either devalue your currency, cut your public expenditures, uh, get rid of the subsidies, because your society isn't functioning and you have no other plan. They want us to organize our economy to pay the debt. We want to organize our economy to eat to survive. Since 1982, the International Monetary Fund has forced the world's developing countries to reorganize their economies to pay their debts. Leaders of the indebted countries arrive in Washington for the IMF annual meeting. They're pleading for new money to reverse the damage done to their economies over the last six years. During the 1970s, the commercial banks lent vast sums of money to the developing world without much thought for how these countries were going to pay them back. Having put their customers' deposits at risk, when the great banking spree came to an end in 1982, the world's commercial bankers turned to the IMF. In 1982, the banks ran immediately to the IMF. The IMF at the time did a wonderful thing to try to get both the countries and the creditors of these countries together to try to figure out some way, number one, of making sure that these countries will, will commence immediately through the process of adjusting their economies to the new realities, and number two, that they will find some ways of servicing those debts so that those debts will not more or less be classified as defaulted loans in the books of the banks. They succeeded. Six years after salvaging the banking system, the IMF, along with its sister organization, the World Bank, now hold the purse strings for new money to developing countries. The bankers have handed over to them the management of the debt crisis. The President of the United States, accompanied by Secretary James Baker. Well, I appreciate this opportunity. His audience, the finance ministers and central bankers of 144 member countries. They include the people who could hold in their hands a solution to the world debt problem. When I first addressed these institutions six years ago, inflation, stagnation, and 21% interest rates were the order of the day. 
21% interest rates detonated the debt crisis six years ago. In 1980, the American people called for fundamental change, reform that would put this country solidly back on the road to growth, expansion, and long-term stability. The picture in the developing countries looks somewhat different. The expansion of trade and international commerce during the last six years has helped keep our prices low and industry and manufacturing competitive and our economy growing. The developing world has been paralyzed by the debt crisis and the drying up of new funds. It all began with Mexico in 1982. The people have paid a heavy price for the solution the IMF imposed to keep Mexico paying the banks. <laughs> No se sabe ni a dónde va a parar ese dinero si lo utilizan para algo que beneficie a todos los ciudadanos de México o para qué es ese dinero, ¿verdad? Más caro todo, que no nos alcanza lo que ganamos. Pobremente nos aguantamos a lo que venga, vamos al día, al día. Aquí la vida en verdad se ha puesto difícil y pues yo con mis hijos tengo que, que ver la forma para poder salir adelante. Wages have been halved, unemployment and malnutrition have nearly doubled, whilst the debt has grown by over $20 billion. John Kavanagh of the Washington-based Institute for Policy Studies has looked at why the IMF was pushed into the center of the debt crisis. In many ways, the IMF have been waiting in the wings for precisely this role, a perfect institution to pick up the role of international economic or financial policemen because they had almost all countries as members. They had the respect of the United States and the private banks. Private bankers very quickly saw that they had an extremely sympathetic institution there and one which would carry out their dirty work. The IMF has allowed countries to take on more debt just to repay the banks, but on tough terms. Bankers cling to the IMF as guarantor that the interest on their loans will be paid. Banks don't feel that they really have the, the power to impose structural reform on a country. The IMF, nevertheless, can impose some type of conditionality on their lending which says that this, this is only available to you if you stick to it, boys. You've got to stick to your guns. If you don't stick to your guns, we don't disperse anymore. I only received one answer from the, the governments and from the bankers. Make it an agreement with the IMF. And this was not what we have in mind. First, I don't have anything against the IMF, but the IMF didn't give any answer or solution for the crisis. The country shares with the bank and the IMF uh, their uh, development plans, their problems, the speed with which they can reduce subsidies, when and how they can uh, devalue their exchange rates, how they are going to cut public expenditures. It's then processed and is turned into often structural adjustment programs which uh, are needed before the bank or fund will lend. And therefore, when a commercial bank sees that, the comfort level rises. Keeping bankers comfortable is not what the IMF was set up for. The 1930s depression and the devastation of the Second World War were uppermost in the minds of delegates from 44 countries who met at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire in 1944. Their mission was to devise an international set of rules for financial and trading behavior. Chairing the conference was the British economist Lord Keynes. Keynes fought for an international bank which would automatically release the trade surplus of rich countries to poorer ones. But the richest creditor, the United States, vetoed giving the IMF powers to regulate their economy and their view prevailed. A key American delegate recalls the conflict. The assumption by Keynes that his plan was needed because there would be a Great Depression and the United States would run big surpluses uh, wasn't really true. We had to tell it that we didn't believe it. We couldn't undertake obligations based on that which would have been onerous to us. What the IMF did do 
was create the financial framework for expanding free trade on a global scale. This was more advantageous to industrialized countries like Britain and the US. When the fund was created, the founder members uh, looking for strong international institutions able to avoid an upsurge of protectionism, able to promote free trade and through free trade uh, more growth, more employment, uh, more well-being in the world. Um, all of this remains true. It is, it has not, the, the IMF has been created for the world's sake not for the rich, nor, nor for the poor. The meeting is called to order. The IMF executive board has always been controlled by the rich. Representing the United States, Charles de Lara has 20% of the votes. Between them, the industrialized countries have a clear majority. Strict conditions for borrowing from the IMF were established early on at the insistence of the US. The formula was elaborated by Irving Friedman. So my thought was that we would sort of hold out the use of the fund resources as a kind of carrot to countries. You first have a very serious review of the country's economic uh, situation. You identify the source of difficulties. You, <clears throat> you point out what things have to be changed. And you make those changes a precondition for the use of the fund resources. That adds up to what we call conditionality. That is painful because it is pressure that's put on often the poor in those countries. Milk prices go up, water prices go up, as the country tries to husband its resources. And the IMF says, and if you don't do these things, if you do not encourage export and discourage import, we cannot lend to you. It's painful, it's difficult. Ironically, the biggest debtor in the world is now the United States. It's never had to submit to the IMF's discipline, as it has had unlimited access to more money. It was the Vietnam War which cost the United States $150 billion, converting it from a creditor to a debtor. To pay for the war, the Americans printed dollars. This soon pushed them to renege on their obligations to the IMF. In 1971, they tore up the Bretton Woods Agreement. The decision bypassed the head of the IMF, who was only informed through his American assistant. I arranged for Mr. Schweitzer to meet with the top treasury people uh, on the evening of August 15, 1971, uh, to be informed of what the president was about to uh, to announced publicly. He was bluntly told to watch the television. ...to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. What the United States did by eliminating its undertaking to freely buy and sell gold at a fixed price and that's what it did do, was not in and of itself illegal. It was a very important decision which had the indirect effect of changing the, the world's monetary system. That system no longer had all currencies fixed to the dollar convertible into gold. It eliminated the IMF supervisory powers. Everybody had their eye on the 30s, beggar my neighbor policies, uh, competitive devaluation, trade restrictions, enmity, all that. The Sir IMF Jeremy Morse, then at the Bank of England, was brought in by the IMF to try and persuade the United States to return to an agreed financial system. But uh, we actually failed to get agreement of that in the late summer of 73, just before the oil price really began to move. And then all that was lost in the oil price rise and the world turned away. The 1973 oil price rise created a whole new source of financial instability. The IMF and the World Bank were pushed still more into the background. Even their employees moved off to the commercial banks where the action now was. 
It was one of them in the world was how difficult we were finding to get countries to provide concessional funds for developing countries, even the poorest countries. I, I left the World Bank and went to the Citibank because I wanted a chance to find new sources of financing for developing countries because I knew the official sources were simply not coming through, even though politically that an insult to the masses and, the, and all this uh, would, would have nothing to do with the IMF. And the banks, I have to say, uh, headed by the Americans, were stupid enough uh, to grant advance payments to Peru without an IMF program. We did not give a soft option to the, to the Peruvians. We made it very clear that they would be expected to have major changes, and they undertook those changes. Dollars in exchange for promises of cuts in millet spending within six months planes from the Russians. No way the banks could monitor the so program agreed uh, between them and Peru. There was pressure which could be brought to bear and, and a year later of course the whole thing and Peru had to end up by going to the IMF anyway. The bankers learned nothing from the Peruvian experience. The IMF seemed powerless to prevent the lending going on and on. All the debtors have spent hugely if it's the war and oh, quite often actually harmed them prestige projects like brand new capital Brazil, Abuja in Nigeria, Dodoma in Tanzania, which cost billions of dollars, uh, like uh, steel plants, petrochemical complexes, often in the jungle or in the desert, an economic airline, the offices of which you can see in the west end of London, immensely expensive highways, which becomes impossible to maintain, and subsidies to the consumption of the rich, like subsidized petrol consumption in Mexico. What does that do with the position of the poor, or with development for that matter? I get impatient with people who say, well, you know, it would have been much better had they done it some other way. Of course it would have been much better. But that wasn't the choice. The choice was to do without the resources. Would Brazil have been better as a country not twice the size today? as is today, 10 years ago, but a much smaller country on the grounds that it shouldn't have borrowed from commercial banks. If the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank had said that the debt of the developing countries is growing too fast relative to the size of their economy and relative to their receipts from exports of goods and services, then the bankers would have had to listen. They couldn't have uh, just ignored these two institutions. The IMF, which had always restrained borrowers, did little to restrain the new lenders. All during this period, by and large, the developing country debt was growing by, say, 20% per year. But it wasn't quite seen to be something that would cut across the whole international financial system. Not yet. The decision that did cut across the international financial system was taken in Washington in October 1979. As President Carter was receiving the Pope, at the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker completed a blueprint to combat US inflation and defend the ailing dollar. Interest rates soared. During the lending boom, Brazil became the eighth largest economy in the world. But even such industrial giants could not withstand the shock of the doubling of interest rates. So you take all those big projects Brazil set up at that time, like the Tubarão steel mill or aluminium uh, smelters. They were designed to supply a certain demand and to give a certain return. Now the demand went down, price went down, and also they had to pay higher interest rates possible to survive this situation. And we were paying these interest rates um, with no control whatsoever on the, on the rates themselves or on the economic phenomena which gave rise to the rates. Now, what did we have to pay for those rates? We had our exports. As the industrialized world went into recession, commodity prices slumped. The price of copper was below the cost of production. And so the West was buying subsidized copper. And so there are industries in Britain, in Japan, in America. Using copper was booming. Using 
subsidized copper from a developing country. Allow me to be a little blunt when I say that some, sometimes the idea that there is some degree of slavery late in 1986 crosses my mind. In 1987, it crosses my mind. Did the third world debt problem cross Paul Volcker's mind? Oh, I don't, I just don't remember one way or another how much thinking I might have done at that time on that particular aspect of the problem. The focus was obviously on the main point at the time that we had an inflation that was accelerating in fact and even more rapidly I think in psychology and the quicker we got a handle on it the easier it was going to be all around. Not that I thought it was going to be easy even then. Some countries were shielded from catastrophe. Following U.S. intervention in the Korean War, South Korea received 15 billion dollars of U.S. aid, more than the whole of South America. With this head start and the efficient use of further loans, Korea boomed. Its streamlined export industry is now so powerful that the country has a massive trade surplus, enabling it to pay back its loans. Most debtors move tragically towards disaster. Driven by high interest rates and low export prices, governments took on more debts. Repito, hemos iniciado conversaciones con el Fondo Monetario Internacional. When the loans dried up and Mexico was no longer able to pay its debts, the country's finance minister announced to a stunned audience that Mexico was back in the hands of the IMF. The big problem for the system would be somehow a, a progressive or quickly progressive uh, collapse uh, of of a number of banks and that could of course be catastrophic for the for the international financial system and for a number of national financial systems the governments came in in great excitement because their banks were at risk and so were these countries and the whole financial system was at risk and they said what do we do about this now instead of admitting their error and, and starting again on a different basis they said well Perhaps they can really pay in real terms. Let's try and get them to do it. If only we correct their errors, they'll be able to pay. To save the international financial system from collapse, governments and banks turn back to the discipline of the IMF. When financing only has the effect of allowing a country to live beyond its means... The IMF forced the banks to come up with new money to keep Mexico paying and the banks in business. In charge of getting them into line was Paul Volcker. It was simply inherent in the situation, and the banks recognized that, that they were going to have to participate. The, uh, the alternative was that public institutions were going to provide all the money, but that was never in the cards. The fund didn't have it, and governments weren't going to provide it. Certainly not against the feeling of earlier profligacy. But I do submit that 945 million is twice that of any other nation. They're telling us today... Whilst the U.S. loudly complained about the cost of bailing out Mexico, another troubled debtor, Brazil, was making even bigger demands on the U.S. coffers. Would you join me in a toast to President Figueiredo, to the people of Bolivia, or to... That's where I'm going. To the people of Brazil. It was actually Colombia. Before he left, President Reagan had lent Brazil one and a half billion dollars to save it defaulting on its loans to the banks. Meanwhile, the bankers took advantage of Mexico's vulnerability by charging an extra 60 million dollar fee to come up with new money. We felt a very great sense of responsibility and at the same time a very great sense of concern about how we were going to move forward in order to avoid a very serious impact for the Mexican society, for the Mexicans. Um, and we wanted to minimize this impact and we wanted to be able at the same time not to get into a war with our creditors. What the negotiators did at that time, they were frightened. They were really frightened at that time. And the banks, they were frightened too. <laughs> 
Imagine our countries asking for help and gaining more interest rate. That was absolutely, absolutely stupid. Frankly, there was no way in which you were going to get uh, banks to put in more money, as they have in very large amounts, unless it had a proper rate of return on it. So the rates, or the spreads, better said, were higher than they should have been in hindsight, no doubt. Some people even said they were punitive. And you will perhaps ask me, what role did the fund play in, in the determination of these interest rates? And the answer is essentially none. The IMF's priority was to keep the banks lending at any price. But ignoring the terms on which the banks lent this new money condemned the developing countries to a future of ever-increasing debt. To get a free quotation for your car insurance, just dial 100 and ask for free phone AA auto quote tomorrow. It is straight, square, curved, circular, the precise shape of every moving part it clings to, lubricating, cooling, and protecting. Oil is too small a word for it. It is Castrol GTX liquid engineering. Fit it in your engine. Lou. Lou Tennant's the name. I was getting nowhere on Candy's case. The chips were down, the place was battered. A French fry let something slip. I ordered a Tennant's Pilsner. The cool taste was heavens above. Then, it clicked. It was an open and shut case. I was a star. I had a choice. Drink my tenant's pilsner. Or head for... It was close, but not that close. Tenant's pilsner. That's good, but <laughs> not that good. Mark and Sue have never taken good health for granted. To be sure of private health care, they became members of Bupa. This priority was brought home to them recently when Sue fell ill. She was treated in a Bupa hospital where her problem was diagnosed with a body scanner. You see, Bupa have priorities too. No one takes a profit. Anything left over from caring for their members today is reinvested for their future, like hospitals, health screening centers, and the latest medical technology. Most people choosing private health care join Bupa. Bupa. Britain feels better for it. The world of wood has many enemies. But thanks to ICI, the wood protection range from Dulux keeps the enemy without out which leaves your wood looking good longer. Dulux Natural Wood Care. It's a rotten world without it. G'day. You look like you need a holiday. A fair dinkum holiday. In the land of wonder. The land down under. Now, there's a few things I've got to warn you about. Firstly, you're going to get wet. Because the place is surrounded by water. Oh, and you're going to have to learn to say good day. Of course, every day is a good day in Australia. Good day, Paul. Good day, love. Of course, you'll have to get used to some of the local customs, like getting the suntan at the restaurant and calling everyone mate. Thanks, mate. She's right, mate. Apart from that, no worries. You'll have the time of your life in Australia. Of course, we talk the same language. Although you lot do have a funny accent. Oh, before you rush out to book your Aussie holiday, Call this number for your free Aussie holiday book. Come on. Come and say good day. I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie for you. Come and say good day.
Since 1982, the IMF has forced Mexico to cut government spending, eliminate subsidies, and devalue its currency in order to balance its books. The whole economy has been geared to obtaining new money from the banks and increasing exports in order to pay its debt. In the community of Tizontiopan, three hours from Mexico City, Rosendo Morales can no longer afford fertilizers following the elimination of subsidies. Eh, sandía, melón, jitomate, tomate, pepino, pero pues todo eso se sostiene a base de insecticidas, fungicidas. Todo, todo, sobre todo ha subido, que nosotros de ese mismo día no podemos sostener el terreno. Agricultural grants have been cut, and Marclovio Contes is at the mercy of the Mexican banks and rising interest rates. No nos alcanza, pero como ya, ya debemos, no queremos quedar este, en drogados, pues aunque vendemos un animal, vendemos lo que tengamos, pero se cubre la cuenta. Five million people had to leave the land last year to supplement their incomes in the cities, as the real value of wages had been halved. Last year, thousands of people crossed illegally into the United States, where they can earn in a few days what they normally earn in a year. Mexico and other countries have deliberately created a recession, a depression, you might say, in their own country, so they could reduce their imports in order to have a surplus with which to pay the interest. And this is bleeding in a real sense of the word. I think the first part of the equation, that is to say, rescheduling new money and severe economic adjustment programs was implemented. The other part of the equation, the dynamism of the world economy didn't happen. Interest rates remain very high and prices of primary commodities didn't go up. So what has happened is that most of the Latin American debtors, Mexico, as a, it's, a, it's a good example, we have suffered a five years period of economic stagnation, of lowering of the standard of livings of the population, and still the problem of the debt is not solved. The IMF formula since 1982 has been implemented in 66 countries, from Brazil to Bangladesh, from Hungary to Honduras, from Peru to the Philippines. Whilst the industrialized world, for the time being, continues to grow, the developing countries have been plunged into a terrible depression. When the IMF comes along and imposes deflation, cuts in domestic demand, devaluation, i.e. depreciation of the currency, and deregulation of the public sector on 20, 30, 40 of the world's economies, it thereby mutually contracts their import trade uh, and contributes significantly to the global slump. Now, nobody believed until the Mexican debt crisis of 1981-82, nobody believed that it was in the world interest or in these countries' interest that at this stage of their development, they should be expected to achieve an export surplus. And the only reason we insist upon it is because we don't yet know what is the alternative? Nowhere has the policy of trying to extract an export surplus from the debtor countries been more tragic than in Africa. Copper is Zambia's main export. Zambia cannot increase its export earnings because of the slump in the demand for copper. When the IMF then demanded the elimination of subsidies on oil and basic foodstuffs, Zambia became the first country in Africa to break with the IMF. But Zambia religiously followed those IMF programs. I still have got to come across any one country in Africa that went as far and as thorough as Zambia did. The Zambian program was uh, underfunded. The Zambian program uh, was uh, mismanaged. Uh, I think we know the reasons why it failed, and it's a complicated reasons. Uh, the, external don the external support was not adequate, and internally there were major mistakes made in, uh, in terms of handling the money supply, handling the budget, um, dealing with uh, crises as they arose, implementation problems. But uh, I would not say that uh, 
Zambia cannot afford to continue that program. Zambia cannot afford not to have a program. When there is an economic problem in the developed countries, we call it uh, a depression. But when there is an economic problem in a developing country, it's mismanagement. If we had to pay every debt that was due in 1987, would have required 116% of our total foreign exchange earnings to do nothing but pay debt. After President Kaunda broke with the IMF, Britain cancelled a 30 million pound loan to Zambia. Africa as a whole is starved of funds. The banks don't want to lend, and the IMF itself is taking back more money than it is lending. These programs have been in general very successful and as you know according to the the IMF rules the um, now it's time for repaying and this country in general in a much better situation are repaying us now what is really disturbing to me is that out of these 25 countries we've identified 17 or so where the financial crisis is so deep the debt burden so heavy that uh, they will not make it. These reform programs will not, in fact, work unless there is an uh, increase in the flow of resources from the outside. Zaire, a crucial military ally of the US in Southern Africa, is one country assured of a flow of resources. President Mobutu's management of the economy has left him with an enormous personal fortune and his country with a debt of $5 billion. In 1986, only days after the IMF suspended its loans to Zaire, Mobutu arrived hot-foot in Washington to see if President Reagan could sweet-talk the IMF. Zaire has been engaged for nearly four years in a series of painful sacrifices and adjustments designed to rationalize and revive its economy and to develop the potential of its private sector. We have tried to help by supplementing our regular development assistance with special funds earmarked for African states who are undertaking serious steps toward reform. President Mobutu has brought a consistent voice of good sense. Within months, IMF funding for Zaire was restored without the usual conditions. The anti-IMF riots in Egypt ten years ago haunts another trusted ally of the West. President Mubarak managed to get easy repayment terms without having to submit to the IMF's usual stringent requirements. Britain, West Germany and the United States instructed the IMF to give Egypt a loan on favorable terms. This did not please the man in charge of the IMF's austerity programs. These instructions implied that we would not be making usual judgments but simply agreeing to the loan uh, because it had been uh, it was politically uh, desired by these uh, heads of state and uh, that uh, direct intervention in the fund was new uh, and was one that i thought should be quickly isolated david finch head of the IMF's Exchange and Trade Relations Department resigned after the loan to Egypt was pushed through. Although Bill Dale had been an IMF loyalist for 22 years, his face didn't fit politically. If your own country doesn't want you to be deputy managing director, and it also happens to be the country with, with the largest voting power in the fund, it probably would be a rather poor idea to try to be deputy managing director. I don't think anyone would want to try to serve under those conditions. The matter of political interference is one the head of the IMF refused to discuss with us. One agency relatively free of this kind of interference has been the Inter-American Development Bank, which last year lent $5 billion to Latin America, much of it for specific projects like this cement plant in Ecuador. This kind of project lending is now threatened. The United States has realized more and more that these banks, both the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, can be very powerful instruments for 
changing policies in Latin America in a way which we like. But they can only do that if they move away from project lending, which is very specific to broad structural adjustment lending, where you give a loan for $200 million and in exchange ask for these 72 things. A recent structural adjustment loan, I think, with Turkey had 72 conditions, all geared towards opening up the economy. In February, Antonio Ortiz Mena, president of the IDB, resigned rather than have a new vice president foisted upon him by the U.S. That man was James Conroe. We have seen time and time again loans come forward uh, for approval in the board of directors, which didn't make economic sense, which did not make financial sense. On occasion, was counter to two programs that the World Bank was trying to negotiate with these countries. You know, I'm putting it in very blunt terms, but that's in, in essence what it is. They want a they want a bank that will it's their bank, as you put it, where they just simply have a check written to them, and they control how those resources are used. They control the priority that gets placed on them. And I, my opinion is that if you're going to do that kind of activity, uh, you can do it without our tax dollars. And the U.S. I think has realized that the only way to win the fight is to get more power in the IDB. And therefore, they have been fighting for an increase, uh, increased power, basically a veto power overall in the IDB. And the Latin countries, quite naturally, have been, have been fighting back. And we're at an impasse now. Uh, it's not clear who's going to win. But it's really, it's a fight over who controls the development agenda in Latin America. Increasingly, Latin Americans have been fighting back. By 1985, the IMF debt strategy was increasingly unpopular. In Cuba, Fidel Castro was urging delegates from three continents to suspend payments on their debts. In Peru, an even more serious challenge was emerging. President Alain Garcia had made militant noises on the debt an integral part of his electoral campaign. On his inauguration, he lost no time in carrying them out. Solo destinaremos al servicio de la deuda externa el no más del 10% del valor total de nuestras exportaciones y no el 60%. Peru would in future only dedicate 10% of its export earnings to paying its debts. James Baker, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, was practically the only person in the audience who did not applaud. It was not a shock, it was a disappointment. We were disappointed. Uh, and, but, but frankly, there was plenty of reason for us to want to deal with the third world debt problem, uh, quite apart from uh, the declaration of uh, Alan Garcia. A red alert was declared as the US Treasury cobbled together a plan to deter other debtors from following Garcia's example. His civil servants were hauled back from holiday to devise the scheme. It wasn't a scientific plan. It wasn't something where we said, OK, the countries we'll deal with are these 15. One day it was 16 countries, one day it was 13 countries, one day maybe it was 17 countries, I don't remember exactly. But in the end, we picked the group of countries, or they picked the group of countries, where the numbers looked good, where you could say commercial banks should increase their lending 2.5% a year. That sounds very scientific. It doesn't sound like you just worked backwards from the end result and then got a nice number. The plan was finalized at a series of secret breakfast meetings between Paul Volcker and James Baker. The idea of the Baker plan was to inject new life into the most indebted countries. Like a three-legged stool, it depended on three factors. Economic reforms in the 15 chosen countries, 10 of them in Latin America, new money from the World Bank and other official sources, and new funds from the banks. The banks saw this as a chance to get themselves out. We were ecstatic. The governments would come in with, through the IMF, through the World Bank, through the American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and provide large amounts of new funding, which would complement ours. That was the best news we had in a long time. The private banks didn't go along. They no longer were interested. They simply wanted to get the money they'd put in out. They didn't want to put in new money. And so Baker has largely been running around saying there will be new money, uh, and yet the private banks haven't gone along. The truth of the matter is that the banks really, one way or another, cannot be expected from the position that they are now in uh, to provide that net inflow.
uh, and it must either come from a resumption of direct investment or uh, more governmental funds or a return of flight capital. It's the commercial bank element of the package that's been disappointing. So I would say that uh, the two legs of it have worked pretty good. The third leg is, uh, is falling somewhat short. So where could new money come from? We looked at the figures for the International Monetary Fund and discovered that in the coming years, it was going to be taking more money out of developing countries than it was, go than it was going to be sending in. And so we looked around for, for another institution that had more money that it could be lending to the key debtors. And what we discovered, or what Secretary Baker discovered, was that there was the World Bank sitting just across the street from the International Monetary Fund. As one of the last sources of new money, the World Bank can dictate stringent lending conditions. Many countries, major debtors, have, adopt, have adopted free market reforms to their benefit. And uh, the, the debate today is not over whether to adopt free market reforms, but how far to go. The, the multilateral institutions have certainly done what we ask of them. They've increased, not only increased their lending, they've done a lot more policy-based lending and structural adjustment lending. See, I feel like in Latin America, the same tenor of opinion, the same direction of events that uh, Mrs. Thatcher represents in an extreme form in the UK, and the French government represents, and the German government represents, and, and what's been going on in the United States and elsewhere. Structural adjustment in, any, in many ways is the third world equivalent of Reaganomics here. Cut back social programs, pull the government out of the economy, let free market forces reign. Well, in the third world, for children, that is disastrous. It may be the one thing between those children and death may be a government program for subsidized milk or for subsidized food. Rogelio Flores risks his life clowning in the Mexico City traffic to provide the main source of his family's income. For him, structural adjustment means reducing his chances of decent housing or a proper job. In Brazil, one and a half million jobs need to be created every year to keep up with the population increase. Instead, the number of jobs is shrinking. One of a growing number of people campaigning against paying the debt is Lula. We have mil crianças que morrem por dia antes de completar um ano de idade de fome. De que no Brasil nós temos 13 milhões e meio de brasileiros com problemas de doenças mentais. De que no Brasil nós temos 13 milhões de brasileiros que comem menos que 1400 calorias diárias quando seria necessário no mínimo 2600. De que nós temos no Brasil uma evasão escolar de 8 milhões e meio de crianças e de que nós temos no Brasil um salário mínimo. We are totally against the selfish motives, selfish designs that tend to make those countries that are developed more developed and those that are developing even poorer. I think that we, we need as an international community to find a solution to this. We simply have reached the bitter end.
final programme next week examines the mounting pressure inside the debtor countries not to pay their debts. And how long will it be before all the debtors unite to defy their creditors? A matter of life and debt next Sunday at the slightly earlier time of five o'clock. There's a free study guide to accompany the series. If you'd like a copy, please send a large stamped addressed envelope to Matter of Life and Debt, P.O. Box 4000, London W36XJ, Glasgow G12 9JQ, 